So Simon Shawcross, you are the author of the One Diet, uh, or is that co-author? Co-author uh, of One Diet. Co- co-author, sorry. Um, personal trainer and co-founder of HitUni.com. That's correct. Yeah. Um, what would be really interesting to start with would be just to understand your background. You know, what, where did where did you come from? How did you get into high intensity training? How did you get to where you are now? Sure. sure. <laughs> um, um, quite a quite sec- circuitous, circuitous route. route. Um, um, when, when uh, I've always been, been very, very physically, physically active, active. Um, um, as a child, I played, played a lot of tennis. tennis. My mum was a tennis, tennis coach, coach, so that was so that in the family. family. Um, um, I was, I was always, always doing something, something physical, physical, whether it be rowing, rowing rugby, rugby, skateboarding, skateboarding BMXing, BMX, mountain, mountain biking, biking uh, uh, even, even some, some, some pretty, pretty middle-ish to longish long distance running as well at one point. Um, and I always needed to, expend physical energy um whilst i was at university i i got into um strength training or weight training or or going to the gym and lifting weights far more and i think as pretty much anybody in this country back then would have done i got into the typical four day five day a week split 45 minutes to an hour per session probably Somewhere between four and six sets per exercise at, at, at my peak of volume style training. Yeah. Um, and this was okay. You know, it did. I got to say, I got some gains at the very, very beginning doing that, being com- pretty much completely new to strength training at that point. Um, and then I needed to get my first job after university and I got a, Pretty damn grueling job in terms of the hours I had to work. What did you study? Uh, I studied business and marketing at university. Um, so I got straight into uh, sort of a manage, managerial type role. And I was working 12 to 14 hour days, just coming straight from uni. And, and the uni lifestyle was, you know, maybe do four hours of work a day. Um, and that. enjoy yourself <laughs> and, and, you know, it was okay to get through an undergraduate degree at that time. Uh, yeah. So I went straight from that into this six day a week, insane, intense work schedule. And I loved the gym at that point. I was absolutely obsessed and I would have pretty much done anything to keep it going, but it was impossible for me to balance that five days a week in the gym with a real job and the commitments that came around a real job. And I think this is something that many, many people get to experience. And what happened was I started to get um, colds and flus really, really easily. And so I started looking around um, for an alternative. I was sure there had to be something out there. And I don't know if you've heard of Mike Mensa. Well, I came across um, a book of his, or, or I think it might have been a tape course of his, a two-tape course of his that was given away in a magazine called Muscle Media 2000. And it kind of blew my mind and really, really annoyed me what he had to say at the same time. Because here I'd been five days a week in the gym, 45 minutes to an hour at a time, um, busting my balls as it were. Uh, there was this guy coming along saying you could get away with one workout a week that might last 20 minutes if you stretch it out kind of thing. Uh, and I had a real resistance to trying it um, until I had the situation where it, it, the training just wasn't compatible uh, with, with the job I was doing at the time. So um, I started just dive dove into performing high intensity training pretty much pretty roughly much as, as uh, Mike Mensa Mike suggested. suggested. Uh, and I, uh, as an aside, I actually I ended up being a, a, um, a, a client of Mike Mensa's for a while, while, while as well. And oh, wait. He wrote me a couple of programs and talked me through uh, what he expected of me for, for a period of around about uh, five or six months. Uh, so that happened very early on for me. Uh, and this was back in 1998, 1999. 1999, I think. And then... By way of Mike Mensa, uh, he highly recommended a book called The Ultimate Exercise Protocol by Doug McGuff. Um, Doug's first book. Well, I, I think it's his first book. I didn't know of that book. Um, I think it's still available um, somewhere, somewhere. It might be listed on Amazon.com. I'm not sure if it's 
if it's just a, a second-hand only affair now, but it, it was a really, really forward-thinking book for the time. I think it was the first book to introduce Time Under Load, um, certainly into the hit world at that time. And again, that really reinforced my understanding of high-intensity training at that point. So needless to say, the results that I got from switching from this five-day-a-week um, protocol to high intensity training as initially recommended or, or structured by Mike Mensah and then uh, McGuff leading on from that um, finally gave me a form of exercise that could be compatible with what I would describe as an adult lifestyle. Tell me when you when you switched over to from high volume to hit. Yeah. Yeah. Did you see uh, an increase in strength and results or were you already at a point where you'd you know you improved your strength to a point where the, the gains were marginal in terms of strength i i i continue to increase my strength pretty rapidly the only thing you've got to um, take into account here is that my technique and my form changed pretty dramatically at the same time. Okay, so I was, I couldn't even tell you what speed my reps were um, when I was doing traditional volume training. I couldn't really even tell you, you know, how good my technique was back then. I wasn't suffering from any joint injuries on a regular basis, so I guess I was doing okay. But what I'm saying is that my mind really wasn't focused on control, um, really efficiently fatiguing the musculature at that time. So when I switched over to high-intensity training, I initially lowered the resistance or the weights that I was using to accommodate a relearning of proper exercise form, proper exercise technique, eliminating momentum, um, from the exercise is really beginning to control the turnarounds at the ends of a range of movements. And then once I'd adapted or um, began to really neurologically get um, that style of exercise, the strength increases kept going and indeed do to this day. Now, in terms of muscular increases, um, I continued to increase um my muscle size going by scale weight combined with calipers um, myself taking the readings so taking them you know there's, there wasn't a mix up with somebody else taking them or a different person each time taking them which could lead to different results now it's not the most accurate way but i was still seeing increased lean tissue gain having said that i have to say i am very much ectomorphic in nature so in terms of um the muscular gains that I made, they did come more rapidly at the beginning of my training exposure. And now I'm just kind of like eking away at it. Um, there are guys that I train who walk in through the door who maybe they're in their late 30s, early 40s now, who um, haven't done any um, exercise, no strength training since they played uh, rugby at, at school. And they walk in through the door and, okay, they may have a little bit of a layer of fat, but already they've got more muscle than I have and they, they're not training. Um, yeah, it's crazy. It's a very small percentage. So it's like 10, 10, 15 percent of the people I train come in like that. And the other interesting fact with those guys is they tend to be the ones who least care about muscle size. Yeah, yeah it's ironic, isn't it? It, it is completely <laughs> ironic. <laughs> cool. Um, just for the listener's benefit, would you be able to provide, I know it's hard to condense it because it, it can be quite complex and you're probably much better at it than I am, but could you provide a summary of high intensity training, what it is, um, and also the type of nutrition that you recommend as well? Yes, yes. I can do can that. Do um, I'll start, start off with the high intensity, intensity training. training. And mm -hmm. obviously, this will be my interpretation of what high intensity training is and the, 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 the style of high intensity training we recommend at hituni.com. So that would be, um, typically speaking, exercise performed once or twice a week. Now, I'm just going to jump into sort of like beyond the first first four or five weeks where uh, somebody new to high intensity training can certainly get away with training a little bit more frequently than that to acquire the skill set of high intensity training more frequently. But if we're, we're talking um, in real broad basics here, uh, strength training once or twice a week, um, typically using... Um, Full body routines, although 
Split routines can work very well, um, but I think it's best to start with the full body, especially if you haven't had any any real experience with resistance training before you go off in that direction, if, if you indeed feel you need to. Um, typically speaking, I would say between um, three and ten exercise movements per workout. Three would be at the very sort of low end um, of the scale on volume. Ten would be at the, at the pretty much the high end. I mean, like, there are a few people who can maybe tolerate um, uh, 12 exercise, 12 exercises in one workout. Um, but I think the sweet spot lies somewhere between five and 10 exercises in a workout, um, whether you're whether you're doing a full body workout or, or a, some form of split routine. Um, certainly, I would recommend people start out with full body routines. Um, with the exercises, um, we're looking to perform them in a way where you, as I mentioned earlier, eliminate momentum, um, make sure that the exercises are com completely congruent, as, as Bill DeSimony would say, or, or biomechanically correct, uh, so you're minimizing uh, wear and tear on the joints, and you're creating a very uh, efficient and effective stimulus for uh, the musculoskeletal system. Um, and typically speaking, I think uh, as a rep speed, I would say the fastest I would I would want to go on an exercise would be somewhere in the region of uh, four seconds for the positive, four seconds for the negative. Um, and at the slowest on some exercises, I probably even can go as slow as, say, 14 seconds, 14 seconds. It really depends on the movement and the, the, the equipment I'm using at the time. Um, in terms of, of frequency, um, once or twice a week, as I started off by saying, would, would be a, a really good long-term approach. In fact, what I do is I'll, I'll cycle through um, periods where, where I've got everything really, really well under control. Uh, in my life, in terms of my nutrition, my stress patterns, my work, I might not be completely full on for a stretch, and I can do two workouts a week uh, really effectively and, and, and reap the rewards of doing so. And then life may get a little bit more busy and a little bit more intense for a while, There's things going on outside of the gym, and I will cycle back down to once a week, and sometimes it might even go to once every tenth day. Um, I think it's good to be dynamic in that approach. Once you've established a ritual or a habit, um, so that you're, you're, you know, it's ingrained in you to work out and to work out in this manner. I think then you can look at refining um, or, or adapting as you go and not getting too caught up on I must train once a week or I must train twice a week. Um, that can fit into your life rather than you having to fit your workouts around. Um, sorry, sorry, rather than having to fit your life around your workouts. Um, I think that pretty much covers it for high intensity training. Was there anything that you feel I've missed out on that? Or did that no, I, that was that was great. Um, I guess yeah. you could one other thing you could add is, which I don't think you said, was the type of movements. Type of movements. Okay, so mm. I'm a big fan of both um, compound um, movements um, and uh, isolation or simple. Uh, movement, single joint movements. I think they both have an important role to play in a well-structured um, training routine. Now, that doesn't mean, for example, you have a big five or a big three, that those aren't great workouts. They absolutely are fantastic workouts. But I think over the course of a training career, over the course of, of uh, the long term, it's most beneficial, if you can, to bring in the use of both those big movements, you know, like the leg press, the pull down, the chest press, as well as um, some of the more uh, isolationary or simple type movements like uh, a lumbar extension, um, which is which can be critical for some people, especially as they get into middle age or, or seniors. Um, and, you know, a leg extension, leg curl, I think uh, both types of movement very much have a place in high intensity training. You don't have to use both types all the time. And if I had to choose, you know, if you said, Simon, you can only have five exercises to use for the rest of your life, probably four of those would be the big compound movement. So it, it, it really depends on where you're going with your training at a, at a particular period of time. Uh, but both can be very useful and in some cases essential if you're talking about rehabilitation as well. Yeah, cool. Thanks for that. So I know people are listening thinking, okay, 
strength training once or twice a week. But what about cardio? <laughs> what, do you, what do you say to that? Um, I say um, in terms of uh, cardio for your health, the strength training, this type of strength training specifically, um, covers you for your cardiovascular health basis. And um, we saw in 2012, um, Steele et al, James Steele, and, and um, the, the, the rest of the researchers on a paper, um, I think James Fisher was involved as well, on cardiovascular uh, effects of high-intensity strength training. Um, or, or strength training taken to momentary muscular failure. And what we're seeing is that, or what we're seeing is that you can take, if you take exercises to momentary muscular failure, you are uh, creating the strongest signal to the uh, entire um, uh, physical system, to the cardio, including the cardiovascular system, um, to um, upregulate, to improve, um, to become all that it can be for an individual genetically. Um, that being said, some individual or individuals who perform, let's say, a sport or um, another activity um, that needs a degree of specific cardiovascular conditioning for that specific activity um, will also need to perform some kind of um, uh, conditioning exercise that prepares them for their sport or activity. Um, so there would be some skill training involved to, to pick up the skills of, of the type of exercise they're doing. There would be some specific conditioning. You know, for instance, if it's running 5K, the conditioning practice pretty much would be running 5K. Um, and then the hit would really round that out. So the high intensity training produces a very, um, strong stimulus for the cardiovascular system. You know, to me, and I'm sure many other people, many other trainers, many other people involved or who've been around high intensity training for a while, this is just a almost a no-brainer. It's almost like it doesn't even need thinking about anymore. And you need to remind yourself there are plenty of people out there who still find this quite a revolutionary concept. Um, and it's important, you know, that we address this, this message clearly to those people. Um, that doesn't mean, on the other hand, um, Lawrence, but I feel that people shouldn't necessarily doing anything in between their hit workouts. I think it's good to be active. Um, certainly for myself, if I'm sitting behind a desk writing most of the day, um, I have a need to go out, whether that be for a walk or to go out on my bike um, or to do some, some qigong or, or some gentle movements. Now, I don't see these as having a, a, a massive... Uh, physiological stimulus for me that I'm not getting from my high intensity training, but they provide me with um, a psychological break, uh, using of my physiology, uh, combined with the using of my physiology that I enjoy. But if you're talking about purely about the health benefits of the, for the cardiovascular system, as opposed to conditioning, um, and as opposed to psychological benefits, um, high intensity training provides um, all the um, cardiovascular benefits you could be looking for from a training protocol. Absolutely. I love it how, what's how Doug put it, you can't get to the heart and lungs without doing mechanical work yeah. and muscle. It just makes so much sense when it's put in that. Basic science. It, yeah. It's obvious then. And then you think, well, you're working parts of your muscular system during a workout to their greatest potential. Uh, in that given workout, of course, it's going to stimulate the cardiovascular system. Yeah, good stuff. Okay, cool. And uh, tell us about nutrition. Okay, so in terms of nutrition, um, where I'm coming from is you could say it is a, uh, a paleo type approach, um, although somewhat adapted, also, I would say. I'm a big fan, you know, of really good choices in, in protein and fats. Um, so, for example, I love uh, and recommend people eat things like steak and chicken and good sources of fish and um, game, uh, lamb, you know, all, all sorts of meat. In terms of um, cooking fats and oils, um, huge proponent of coconut oil. Um, and uh, 
you know, proper butter, grass-fed or pastured butter, um, and olive oil as well. Um, so that would cover besides primarily in terms of the proteins and the fats. And then, you know, of course, it's, it's pretty much we all know in terms of the, the, the green leafy vegetables, as much of that kind of stuff as you want. Um, and I'm trying to leave the, 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 the carbohydrates to last here. Um, what else are we talking about? What else do we need to have in there? So, you know, so if we talk about fruits as well, that's where we start to cross over into the carbohydrates. So I think, you know, I think it's important or, or can be beneficial to have, um, some fruit, uh, in the diet, um, whether that be berries or even, um, apples, bananas and so on. And then in terms of sort of what we would, consider the traditional starches, um, I think it depends what you're looking to do with your nutrition um, at a specific time. But I do think it's beneficial to have some carbohydrates in the diet, um, obviously. Um, things like white rice, sweet potatoes, white potatoes. Uh, is white rice better than brown rice? I get confused. It, it is, yes. And the Why is that? reason for that... Um, is the anti-nutrient in the bran or the husk, as it were, of the brown rice, which are milled away um, when you're processing white rice. So it's one of those instances where a processed food is actually uh, preferable to to a completely natural food, as it were. Okay, that's a bit unusual. Yeah. That processing, that milling away, uh, leaves a pure starch. So, uh, and I think there are a few anti-nutrients possibly left in white rice, but luckily for us, when you boil the rice, that inactivates them or, or makes them inert. So, um, yeah, well, white rice is, is one I'm a big fan of. So I'll, I'll also eat um, well, uh, noodles made from rice, so what they call them vermicelli noodles or, or Singapore noodles, um, which are the, the, the thin strips which have been made from rice and not and not from from wheat or, or, or other types of grain. Uh, okay. I find really, really freeing and helpful in the diet. Now, um, I have quite a fast metabolism, um, so I can eat quite a bit of carbohydrate, and that supports my training. It supports my resistance training and my um, uh, goal of increasing lean tissue. Some other people can be very sensitive to it and, and you know, put on quite a bit of weight just by almost looking at uh, Sort of uh, sources of carbohydrate, so that's where I think it starts to become more of an individual thing. Um, we're we're all um, you know human. We all run on the same physiology essentially, but our genetics uh, differ in certain ways, and we need to be uh, we need to adapt our style of eating to what works for us over the long term. Um, whether your goal is to reduce fat currently, or whether it's to maintain. Um, your your body weight currently, whether it's to even increase um, lean tissue and support that. Um, but I, I think certainly in the strength training world, there's often an, uh, an overemphasis put on sort of eating as much as you want um, or, or eat as much as possible to support muscle growth. Well, I did that in my mid-20s and I gained a lot of fat. Right. Like I couldn't gain muscle as quickly as I could gain fat. When I was providing my body with an excess of calories. Yeah. So I think it really needs to be individualized. Um, essentially, to, to make it as simple as possible, it's like eat stuff that's, you know, pretty damn easy to get a hold of and natural. You know, it, it doesn't come in a microwave box. It doesn't, uh, you know, come in multiple colors created by food dyes. Um, Something that you could pick. I think I read this from Doug, Doug at one point. You know, something you could pick off a tree, um, catch it with a spear, or pick it up off the ground and eat it. You know, if it falls into those categories, you're pretty damn safe with it. And of course, I'll tell you what. Just sorry, just to interject before I forget this question. Yeah, it really interests me. You said about are you you can get away with eating um, carbohydrate because of your your metabolism, um, and you do so for for lean mass. Where I get a bit confused is protein when you eat protein when you eat lean it goes yep. through gluconeogenesis yep. to be converted into glucose right so why is carbohydrate necessary and i see it a lot in these kind of um you know if you look at tim ferris for have you read four hour body 
I, I haven't read it in it in, in it's a okay. big book, it's about the size of the Bible. I haven't read everything in there, but I have read um okay. chunks which interested me as I as I flip through it. So I found it a good book a, a good book. Okay, cool. Yeah. So in his strength training, which is very, very it's basically high intensity training, um for for, to, for the uh, the best protocol for mass. And he says to include things like quinoa and um Oh, I think white, white or brown rice in, in evening meals. And I'm just thinking, well, is that necessary if you're having enough protein? What do you think about that? Um, um, I, think I think there is a need for uh, sugars um, in the human physiology. Um, and there is a need for sugars in the brain. And as you rightly mentioned, you don't have to have carbohydrate to get those because the body will take protein and uh, convert that into uh, usable sugar in the body. Um, at the same time, I think if um, we have that available to us, we don't need to put a stress on the body, unless we're specifically doing it for a specific reason, to have to go through that extra process. Um, and, you know, if we're really looking at it through a... a Paleolithic type lens. Um, there would have been at certain times of the year and in certain parts of the world quite a percentage of the diet based around carbohydrates. Um, and I don't think that's controversial. Of course, the advent of um, agriculture um, around the Nile, Nile Delta area um, where grains started to be grown and, and, and agriculture really took a foothold made a huge impact in, in the balance of the diet, um, which, you know, had some really beneficial effects in terms of human society and, and uh, humanity and the spread of our DNA. And, you know, it kept a lot of people out of famine and, and uh, enabled uh, the distribution of labor to be split apart so we weren't all concerned about food the whole time and, and hunting our food the whole time. We could, you know spend our brain power elsewhere, which uh, allowed for adaptation um, far more swiftly than would have been otherwise possible, but at the same time might have caused us some challenges along the route in terms of individuals and our individual health. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I saw your slide on um, your 21 convention presentation um, where we, from, uh, was it three million years ago to um, 10,000 years ago, we lived off a non- refined carb yes. uh, diet and the the time span from 10,000 years ago to now is a, a blink of an eye um, and, and, and you, you explain quite well how we're not evolved um, to eat a lot of the foods we have today which I think is kind of common sense I suppose when you think about it. It is and, and all these foods they're, I mean they're really uh, addictive, they're really tasty, they're really convenient in terms of when I say tasty I mean that sort of instant hit. And, and human society is just tending to go in this convenient direction for many, many individuals. And it's all that temptation is always going to be there. Um, I, I think it's also really important to get across that I don't eat perfectly the entire time. Uh, if I can eat really well 90% of the time, I'm really happy. And if I'm going out or to hook up with some friends and we're having pizza, you know, I'm going to have a couple of slices of that pizza and I'm not going to feel that's the end of the world. And I think, you know, we can get a little bit too um, overly concerned and we can put too much stress on ourselves perfectly. And we don't need to, the vast majority of us don't need to eat perfectly the whole time. Look, some, there are some individuals that are really at one end of the scale who maybe do need to be ultra aware, at least for a period of time, because, you know, they might have um, issues that really need that level of focus for a period of time. I agree with that. Yeah. But for the majority of us, you know, if we can eat right 80 to 90 percent of the time, like, except the fact we live in this crazy modern world that we live in and and there is this stuff, and if you're eating well 89% of the time, compared to most people, you are doing really, really well. <laughs> I agree. Are you, uh, are you uh, familiar with the slow-carb diet? Um, it sounds kind of familiar, but if you were to ask me um, exactly what it is, I, I, I couldn't tell you. So. Um, oh, that's okay. It's, uh, it's, it's, 
it's you know it's it's a basically a cyclical ketogenic type of diet, low carbohydrate. It's very similar to your diet. Yeah. Um, but it's just you know what you can you could I could take your diet, add a few things, remove a few things, and then label it something else. So it's just um, it's just a, a yeah, variation. I, I, there are loads of books out there which are, 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 are really putting across a great message mm. uh, in terms of um, nutritional and nutritional approach. Um, and you know, ours was, was one of those for one diet, and there are you know others out there doing a, a similar thing. And and I, you know, I in my learning, I I take things from lots of different sources. Um, and I think you 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 pick it, you find a path if you're looking for it. You will find what works for you, and it might take you know a handful of books to get to that place. But if you know, for, for me, if I if I can get you know a few usable you know, you know, thoughts out of somebody's blog or out of somebody's book. I think it's brilliant. I think it's great. And, and you know, we want to absorb as much information as we can from as many places as possible and, and, and continue to question our own beliefs about nutrition and exercise as well. That's critical, isn't it? That having that, those critical thinking skills and being aware. Yeah. I think yeah. there's so few people that have that. And it's really frustrating sometimes, especially when you're trying to have a conversation with someone about health and fitness and, and those kinds of subjects that people are so, um, I was, I was listening to a podcast the other day and they were discussing how food for most people is like religion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, it, it, you taken the words right out of my mouth. What, what was just about to come out was, you know, what we don't want to do is turn exercise and nutrition into a dogma. Yeah, exactly. Um, um, which, you know, you'll, you'll get some really absolutely sh- crazy strong adherents and they will defend their cause to the end of the year you, you know it is always good to question you know in in the light of the latest research in the light of um you know a a, a thought or a suggestion or a question somebody's made as to um well how does that fit into my my world view or my my global view on exercise or nutrition at this time and do I need to look into that area a bit more or what do I think about you know using the mind is is such a valuable it's such a valuable tool we have and, and I think it's always useful to to question our beliefs about nutrition and about exercise definitely and right. at the same time, oh, sorry I just, sure. I just want to jump in and say and at the same time to avoid driving yourself wild as well I, I sometimes talk from a trainer's perspective or or, or, or a writer's perspective about these topics but you know if you are doing it because you've heard about high intensity training and the benefits or, or about the one diet or the, and the benefits it can do for your health and you grasp the basic outline and you, you pretty much know how to apply this basic template and you're not interested in learning anymore because I don't know you're a chess grandmaster or, or you love going skydiving and that's your passion then no I don't think you have to be you know reading every bloody thing about a high intensity training or nutrition um, as much as you've got time for um, yeah it's having those reliable heuristics isn't it and rely on some experts, and rely on some experts you, you 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 found resonate with you um, but if you, you know, if you're a trainer, then I think it's your responsibility to, to delve into this stuff. Mm, absolutely, cool. Um, here's, here's an interesting one. So, how do you? I guess like a kind of two part question. Do you struggle to educate people on these concepts, especially high intensity training? Um, and how do you overcome resistance from people? I love the question. That's awesome. Um, I don't struggle with it at all on a so on a on a personal level on a trainer's level um when somebody comes to i i would say i probably get three types of clients typically who come to me uh, the first one and the easiest uh, type of client to work with has read body by science oh really and turns up and they say yeah yeah i i read the book and found you or I've read, I've read the book, the book and tried to apply it myself, and I just want to see if I'm doing it right. Okay. And they've already got some of these concepts that we've been talking about, excuse me, in their mind. Then you've got somebody um, who um, has heard of high-intensity training but cannot believe it and is coming to prove me wrong. Brilliant. Weird as it may sound. Yeah. And they're turning up, you know, I read read this on your blog or 
I heard about this type of exercise and I cannot believe it, it it's true. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm coming here to, you know, actually the, the people who've done that haven't admitted that to me to start off with. They've told me afterwards. Uh, but I would, tr- I would also treat them as I would anyone else. Um, anyway, and then, and then you've got the other kind who've just heard about you because you're a personal trainer and they want to come along and be personally trained. They've never heard of high intensity training before and you're introducing it to them. So I, I have no challenge explaining high intensity training and the benefits and, and the whys and wherefores in a pretty succinct manner. I've been doing this since 19, no, 2000. Right. Wow. So I, know how to explain it to people and and um i think the key factor is as a trainer is looking at the client listening to the client's questions initially and finding out how much information do does that individual need some will need very very little they they just need the basics outlines from what they're expected to do and they're good to go you know very black and white thinkers in many ways and you just tell me what to do and i'll do it and then you've got um mr needs to know it all at the very other end of the scale who who's going to ask you exponential amount of questions you know in fact you could sit there talking all day without getting them on on the equipment if if you let them (laughs) yeah um so it's good to judge as a trainer how much information does this person need, this particular individual in front of me need? Um, so if you see their eyes glazing over, that's a good reason to uh, haul it back in and move on to the next topic. Um, pretty simple stuff, really. Um, and just go through very clearly, you know, why we do this type of exercise, the, the scientific proof that, that is now behind it. And I think we're living in a, a fantastic era you know obviously back in the the, the late 60s and 70s you had a, a real trailblazer in, in terms of somebody like arthur jones but i think we live in a fantastic era now there are a lot of people writing about high intensity training um, there are more people getting interested in it and uh, we have some fantastic researchers um, performing some really good research um, specifically around high intensity training pretty much as you or I would apply high intensity training and you can get this message across to people um, with as much detail or as little detail as that individual needs um, what have they got to lose from from attempting it nothing um, so the next um, challenge is can you sell high intensity training to everybody and i think the answer to that currently is is no i think there are some people who who just aren't going to get it at least not in this moment they're not quite ready for it just yet and typically speaking the ones who i found um to be most like that are those who have a very strong background with exercise Okay, so they might be a triathlete or a, a um, somebody who's involved in, in very athletic pursuits. In some ways, they off currently, and in some ways, they often have um, very um, preconceived notions about how exercise should feel or, or, or the buzz that they particularly get from doing exercise. And it's very challenging. Uh, sometimes, not always, with, with, with this type of individual, to get them to really slow down, to really focus on every moment in the movement, to really um, excel at producing great technique, because oftentimes they kind of like to thrash around and do, almost do this sort of macho type thing of really pushing hard. There's a lot of leakage, as I would say, in, the, in terms of the exercise they're performing. But yeah, it feels intense. Um, and it feels tough, but it's sort of like a CrossFit type uh, thing going on. Um, so they can be the most challenging. Um, and often um, when I've worked with people like that, they, they might have another coach as well who, who's got a vested interest in, in sort of a more high, high volume approach to exercise. So I find those to be often the most challenging people. Although having said that, I've worked with some athletes who've got it straight away or they got it after, let's say, uh, six weeks to eight weeks. Uh, and they, and then they might say to me, you know, oh, I was really, those first three or four weeks, I really wasn't sure about it. 
but you know something happened in week six where wow I got it and now I know what you're talking about intensity and now I get it and and I think that's the that is the biggest challenge for us as trainers is getting people through those first six weeks because okay the exercises um, in the initial say two three sessions may, might feel quite intense but in my view of a high intensity workout they're not high intensity yet. They're not performing a high intensity workout yet. They're learning the skills that are required to perform a high intensity training workout. And there's no shortcut to this either, Lawrence. You, you, you've got to take people through this process. And in terms of refining technique, that's a lifelong process. But to get them to really um, perform well um, or well enough to extract what I would call a proper experience of, of what I would consider a high intensity training workout, they're not going to have that likely till, till somewhere between session four and six. And so you, you, you've got to um, engage the client and um, excite the client um, and um, get them to understand, to explain yourself as clearly as possible as to why you're doing this the reasoning behind it and how it is going to feel and what we're looking to achieve at the end of the set so that they very clearly in their mind have an end point, a, a goal in mind of, of what I'm expecting from them ultimately in terms of exercise performance and intensity. Um, once people had that experience, and like I said, for some people it might come session three, four, for others it might come session seven, eight, um, but once you've had that experience, you get high intensity training and there's no going back. You, you can't unget that experience. You, you've had it. You've grasped it physiologically. You know, it's anchored in your body now. Um, and that's what I'm that's the experience I'm looking for the client to have. And once they've had it, that's it. I, I, I think then you've got um, positive exercise addiction. Um, I, I don't know if you have this experience, Lawrence, but, but that massive bud after you complete your workout. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's more like relief, actually, because <laughs> especially if you get off there. Uh, yeah, have you ever have you ever trained at Kaiser before in London? Yeah. You have? Yes. Oh, cool. So that's where I train. Yeah. Um, and you know the MedX B6, the Legos? Yeah. Once you've just done... 90 seconds of 400 pounds on each leg you are so happy it's over you know yeah <laughs> yeah people, sometimes a client will ask me um you know oh and, and you must love exercise and you must love exercise. <laughs> and i love the concepts of exercise i love the effects of exercise and i love the um the, the knowledge and the con concepts around it and so on do i love the workout itself I love the mental challenge and the physiological challenge of it, but it's challenging. You know, it's, yeah. it's not necessarily what you would describe as a pleasant experience while you're doing it. But that's yeah. the moment you've gone through your workout. Boy, that buzz. That, that feels so good. And I, I, I have a, a lovely lady that I train in her 60s who says, you know, my cells feel like they're doing a happy dance. <laughs> she's oh, absolutely way of right. putting it. Her. Yeah, my cells are doing a happy dance when I finish the workout too, and I, I think anybody who's had a, a proper high intensity training workout can can relate to that, and and that's a huge pleasure. And and I think that's addictive. And and once people have got what you expect of them as a trainer, and they perform the workouts in that manner, and they're refining week by week their performance, and and they're doing um, everything they can to chase down the intensity and chase down effective momentary muscular failure at the end of the set. And they've, and they've they've got, got it conceptually it. in their mind what they're, they're, you're expecting of them, and they've they've got the exercises neurologically speaking. Uh, boy, it's powerful medicine, and it's a real buzz, and it feels great. And and you feel great after doing high intensity training. You know, the, the feedback I get from new clients typically is is wow. You know, the first thing I noticed like three four weeks into this is suddenly I. I was sitting at my desk and I realized I was sitting up straight without even thinking about it. You know, but I think some of the first changes people notice are posturally. Yeah. And, and they're just aware of how their body, how their muscular system is holding them. 
And then the next thing is the, oh, yeah, I didn't used to be able to lift, you know, three bags of shopping in from a car when I was coming back from a supermarket. And the other day, you know, I carried three in each hand as I was doing it. And I got to the door before realizing what I'd done. Yeah. And it's this, these real, you know, but, you know, that's for somebody who might, you know, might have not been exercising for a while. If you've been strength training already, that, that might not be such a huge shock for you. But, but for, for many of the people, and I think um, this is another really valuable audience for intensity training is, is you know, as people get into their 40s, their 50s and their 60s, and, and especially if somebody's had a desk job for most of their life, this is where you can make a massive massive change in your life you know i, I love I love training the guys and girls in their 20s um and, and so on but I, I the ones that i really really almost feel it in my heart as i do it is is um those people who are who are rapidly approaching dysfunction physically or, or are in dysfunction and you manage to change that or turn that around for them and you 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 know it's hard to say but you might have added another 10 20 years of functional life on tack, tacking that onto the end of their, their life that's a that's an amazing thing to do for people so no, i couldn't agree more um i see you as being a big part of this movement in the uk i mean when you look on the internet and you try and well I, perhaps i might be looking in the wrong places but i can't see a lot of people in the uk that are that are pushing high intensity training and and well, you're I think you've got, you've got the science guys um, who are doing amazing stuff. Uh, okay. So we've got James Steele and James Fisher. Of course. And yep. others. others. We've got uh, uh, others as well. So there's a guy called Dave Smith up in Manchester. Um, and you see on many of the research papers, it, it'll be, especially the ones from the UK primarily, but it'll be these guys behind them. Yeah. So the stuff on HIT and cardiovascular health and... and um, there was a, a recent one which I've blogged about recently as well um, on uh, going to momentary muscular failure versus going to repetition max go versus rest, pause, exercise. Uh, oh, interesting. I have to read that. A fantastic piece of research, um, uh, which which also in, involved a professor from, from Germany as well who's, who's published quite a few hit papers over in Germany. Uh, so on the science side, I think we've got it covered. Um, there's a lovely guy called uh, Ted Harrison, um, who's got a fantastic uh, gym, um, Essex Way, it's called Vital Exercise. All right, yep. As well. So there, there are a few people out there doing doing things um, in the UK, but I think it needs to be a lot more. Um, uh, a lot more. Tell me, what, what sort of plans do you have? What's, what's next for you? Well, what we're looking to do um, with HIT Uni, the, the first thing is we live in an age where we have an amazing ability to convey information in a way that it has never been possible before to, to a, a number of people that has never been possible before. And we can do it in a way which is um, visually engaging and appealing um, and can be done at the end user's own convenience. So that's exactly what we've looked to do with Hit Uni is to use the, the technology that we have available to us with an online platform today to deliver really, um, really good quality information um, in a, through multimedia. So a lot of video, a lot of visuals, a lot of images, as well as um, the papers and the, uh, and the text to back it up as well and the recommended reading. And yeah, so a lot of work went into that, didn't it? I mean, I saw I was watching a video of you going through the course, your your personal training course on the website and there's a ton of data i mean is that all yourself or is that um a, a team that that help you do that um it's pretty much um myself and my partner joanna um who just over the last two years um have three years now have just been continuously working away at this stuff and a wider team beyond that as well of, of people who contributed um, to the course and contributed information or their time um, to bringing this thing together. Um, I'd like to shout out uh, a guy who helped out, Sean Polinay, who, who, who was really, um, really helpful as well. Um, so it, it, it's, but it's the product of um, a, a team of people putting together um, or helping me put together a really um, cohesive and comprehensive course or, or series of courses. 
Um, what we look to do with it is to make it as comprehensive and yet as simple as possible. So it's broken down into usable chunks. So whether you're whether you've got time to study 10 minutes in the evening because you're super busy, or you can you know dedicate three hours a day, the way we we've, we've structured the course is such that you can um, you can easily pick up um, what you need to, regardless of the time constraints that you may or may not have at a particular time. Um, so our goal with that is to get as many people who are interested in exercise to become interested in this type of exercise, high intensity training, high intensity exercise, and then to become qualified so that they can train as many people um, to a standard um, that's really, um, really good. So, you know, excellent. In terms of in terms of a trainer's knowledge and their ability to convey this information and apply it in a physiological manner um, to other people, so that whether you're in the Gold Coast in Australia or, or you're in Alaska or you're in London or you're in Atlanta, New York or, or wherever, um, individuals will have somebody a trainer that they can go to. Um, and, and that really is the goal. goal. And, and and then, then a secondary, secondary goal by the, the blog, blog at Hit Uni, Uni is to, is to um, is to get to people interested in general, general um, in high intensity training. training. So we look so to we put out stuff on there, but is, is um, it, it can be quite technical sometimes, um, no. and and that's really you know for our target audience of the people who are looking to become uh, high intensity training uh, experts or high intensity trainers. Um, and also, we like to, to mix that up with some more um, fundamental or, or perhaps basic interpretations of high intensity training and topics around high intensity training and nutrition that will uh, raise people's interest in general in high intensity training. So you don't have to be a trainer to, to come to the site and, and, and reap the rewards of reading the blog. Um, you might be interested in it for your own health, your own exercise, and, and so on. So I think that, that that's the two point goal, um, ultimate goal that, that, that we really have for, for Hit Uni is to educate as many people as possible about this fantastic, efficient, effective type of exercise, and then to provide trainers who are capable of um, training people in this manner effectively, efficiently, and safely. That's cool. I think it's a great business model. Um, and I think what's cool about it, like you said, is it's you're creating kind of exponential awareness, if that makes sense. So the more people you train, the more people are going to be exposed to this type of training um, yes. in terms of their clients and their clients and so on. And I think that you're doing a great service to a lot oh, of people. Thank you. Um, no, it's, it's really cool. Um so, OK, cool. In fact, just talking about your course, I am um, almost well, I probably will do it at some point. Um, I'm, uh, I'm I've got a few things on the go at the moment, but I am really interested in doing the course. Uh, and like you said, I like the format and um, be really cool, actually, at some point to come up to your facility. Or yep, yep. You, you have a do you own a facility or you? I, I, I work, work, work with people. people. I really cut back on on. Um, I do still work with people personal training wise. I, I, I limit the number of days um, a week. Hit uni is really taking over my time now. Uh, so I limit the number of days uh, that I do that. Having said that, you, you are m most welcome, Lawrence, to come along. And, and anybody who wants um, to, to come along, if I can, can fit you in, I will do so because I'm still like to be at the coal phase, as it were, at the cutting edge of, of working with people. And even if it's only giving somebody, you know, a one-off brush up or whatever on, on high intensity training um, uh, or a chat about it or, or whatever, I, I really like to get the message out by, by whatever means necessary. And which brings me on to a point is that not everybody can afford to have a personal trainer all the time. But I think it's really valuable to have the experience um, of a really good high intensity training session with a, a great trainer 
you know, so so if you're in Florida, it could be with Drew Bay. If you if you're down in South Carolina, it could be with Doug. If you're in London, it could be with me. Uh, you know, there, there are some great trainers out there. Um, if you can find somebody in in you know within a reasonable radius for you to go to, um, to have even if it's just a once or twice off thing, so you really get it. I think that would be a an, a, a fantastic investment for anybody out there. Uh, of, of their time and whatever it would cost financially to do that once or twice. Yeah, plus, we always train better when someone's watching us. Oh. You, you, you know the whole form of yeah. things. Yeah. Um, you know, I I was uh, I was doing the Big Five at Kaiser, and I had my girlfriend uh, come along. She actually trains there now as well. Awesome. And yeah, it's great. <laughs> and uh, one uh, one session, she supervised me and kind of like you know helped me with form and et cetera. Yeah. And I smashed it. Yeah. Every, every single machine I did a PB. It's probably a bit of testosterone there wanting to impress. Um, <laughs> but there's definitely something to be said for someone who is – what just someone being there to watch you is one thing. And then the other bonus, if you've got somebody who really knows what they're doing, they can really help correct your form and, um, uh, and, and make sure that you give the best performance that you possibly can. So – yeah, I hundred percent agree with that. Yeah, I, I, I'm absolutely the same as you um, in that respect. I have my best workouts when I'm being observed. Those last twenty seconds of a set are a challenge. I don't care who you are. A, 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 the greatest physiological slash psychological challenge to a degree that you're likely to have in a typical week. Having somebody observing you in that moment of each of your exercises as momentary muscular failure is, is accumulating mm. is it raises the game. And um, I, I think as a trainer, especially because you know what you teach, if you have somebody watching, you're thinking I've got it. I need to adhere, you know, absolutely. I must adhere to my own standards. Um, so it certainly raises the game. And I've, I've definitely had my, my best workouts under supervision of somebody else, whether it's just somebody observing who knows how to take the timings and count the reps without, you know, giving the feedback or somebody who's very, very good. And, and probably the best um, the best trainers I have had train me is Doug. And, and You've had Doug train you? I have. Yeah. yeah. So fortunate. Yeah, it was, it was a fantastic experience, and he's a great trainer. You know, he's one of those people. And the other guy I wanted to mention who, who I've had one of my best workouts is the guy I mentioned earlier as well, Ted, Ted Harrison. Okay. Um, both of those workouts were people who knew in, in their own way, in a slightly different way, when to say exactly the right thing to extract that little bit more out of me. They weren't constantly at me the whole set. You know, they weren't gabbering away the whole time. They were two trainers with a lot of world experience who knew when to say the right thing in the moment. Yeah. And, and boy, did it make it, uh, an impact on the quality of the workout I had. Yeah. Cool. Good stuff. OK, so shifting gears slightly, it's something I, I wanted to talk to you about, which is um, something I think we, uh, we kind of have a similar, 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 similar situation. If I get my words out. Um, so you're you're. you're, you're obviously quite a lean guy, um, as am I. Um, and what, what I find quite challenging personally, so I'm being a bit selfish here in my questions, but yeah, um, yeah. is the battle between longevity. So looking at, okay, I'd rather eat perhaps less and fast on occasion for longevity because I believe that that is healthy long term and I want to live you know, a long, healthy life that is of high quality yeah. versus, hmm, actually, you know what, I'd like to put on another half a stone of muscle mass and therefore I will eat this much volume yeah um do you think that guys with genes that are more towards ectomorphy yeah um can use exercise protocols or nutrition nutrition to gain muscle and should they can can they use exercise protocols yeah they make a big difference if you know you are a you are ectomorph it will make a difference Mm. um now you're talking, uh, we can talk, uh, let's just say we take um, uh, people that you consider, or we consider to be exomorphic. Mm-hmm. Within that group, there's going to be another subscale going on between somebody at one extreme end who might not be able to add any muscle tissue. Have you ever met anyone like that? I, 
haven't met anybody who hasn't been able to gain some muscle tissue, though I have met some people who have only gained a very um, moderate, very small amount of muscle tissue. And they're only, you, you can tell who those people will be before you, you know, you ever see them train. Um, they, they will look like the archetypal to an extreme ectomorph. You know, very, very slender, um, muscles over, over the, their bones and often, you know, typically speaking, exceptionally low body fat. It's, it's one of those things where you've got to um, kind of accept the hand you're dealt at the end of the day. And now I've got to be careful not to go too much one way or too, too much the other way here. Um, I, I've been through in my late 20s a, a sort of a frustration of, you know, can I build any more lean tissue? Can I build any more lean tissue? You know, being very dissatisfied um, with with my physique at that time. Um, compared to some people, my physique was way better. Compared to, you know, um, sort of uh, some people at the other end of the scale. You know, I, I'd look at those. And, and like we started off by saying, you know, those, those clients who walk through the door and they're, they're already carrying a ton of muscle. And, and they've done nothing. And, and to, to accumulate that muscle tissue is literally the parents um, that they had that, that, that gave them back. Um, I think it's really important, like with the nutrition, to not beat ourselves up. At some point, an individual has to become happy with their genetic hand and happy with optimizing that. Yeah. Um, within that context, do everything that you can to optimize your physiology. So that would be primarily, and I, and I know Doug's a big proponent of this as well, primarily it would be, you know, you've got to look after your nutrition, your sleep cycle, um, your stress levels, you know, maybe you need to do some meditation. You've got to, you've got to have that big picture because we're talking to a degree ultimately about you know what's happening hormonally in our body as well not only the muscle fiber typing that we have and so on but hormonally are we um creating an environment in which muscle growth is is, is possible um because if you're if you're an extreme ectomorph and you're not doing those things then really you're not going to gain lean tissue. Whereas if you have those things in place, and again, you know, I'm not expecting them to be in place 100% of the time, but if you can get them there 90, 80, 90% of the time, have a great lifestyle, and you put that high intensity training stimulus in there, you are, if, if it's possible for you, you are going to gain as much lean tissue as you can. And, you know, there are some guys who, and girls who, who have immense amounts of lean tissue just just because of how they you know who they are and you have others other people who who do not at the other end of the spectrum and you know that shouldn't define us as individuals um for sure anyway but if you want to have the best body you can have take care of nutrition um stress stress levels sleep cycle sleep cycle pattern uh, work-related work stress. stress. Who are you spending your time with? You know, uh, the people, the people you were stressing you out, the people whose company you enjoy, um, and are really effective and efficient high-intensity training stimulus. Then you will have the best body ultimately that, that that you can have. And you know, don't don't undereat. That's for sure. But don't overeat as well. You know, you only need to really be supplying a surplus of about 200 calories uh, a day. Um, to support any possible lean tissue growth. That's uh, interesting. When people go up on the, you know, maybe 250, but when people are on the sort of, you know, 1,000 calories plus above um, their, their requirement in, in a, in a uh, sort of hard gainers or um, uh, ectomorphs attempt to gain lean tissue, you know, you're going to put on fat pretty rapidly and your mind is probably going to be saying to you, yeah, there's some, there's some added muscle underneath that. I know there's some added muscle underneath that. Um, 
the likelihood is you might be fooling yourself and you might be going too far. It's far harder to get rid of body fat than it is to, to you know, gain it in the first place, typically. And, uh, yep. and ectomorphs have a challenge gaining body fat sometimes, but if you push that boundary and you push it too hard and, you know, that, that thing that you were kind of blessed with as an ectomorph, which might have been a natural four pack or six pack, is suddenly completely blurred. You've lost one of your advantages, which was very good. You know, there are so many guys in their 40s who've got that, you know, not massively overweight, but they've got that little extra layer so you can't see a six pack. You know, the one, one advantage some ectomorphs do have is they have a pretty damn clearly visible six pack from day one. Yeah. So play to your strengths, I would say, as well. And, and, you know, it's a little bit like the straight hair, curly hair thing. You know, people always want what they don't have. Grass is always greener. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> no, that's, that's really, it's really good. At the same time, I, I want to emphasize, but I'm not saying, you know, uh, certainly not saying give up and, 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 and don't do anything. But come to some, it, it, psychologically, it's going to be healthy for an individual to come to a resolution in their mind that they're acceptant um, of um, their body type whilst pursuing what they consider a value. And if that is lean tissue, if that is a massive value for you, um, then do everything you can to, to optimize that because that goal is obviously important to that individual in those circumstances. But it reminds me of something Mike Mentor said to me, you know, Back in 1999, this would have been now. And it was, you know, there's a guy he knew who was, I think it was, it was, he was either a midget or crippled. And you think of what, typically speaking, your body is compared to that guy who was, I think it was somebody who was begging on the streets in, in, in LA or wherever uh, Mike was referring to. And you think of yourself compared to those people if you're dissatisfied with your muscle growth. Think how kind of lucky you are. Mm-hmm. Um, to have a functioning body that can engage in, you know, intense physiological activities and can go and play tennis or play basketball or lift weights or do high intensity training or go for a bike ride in, in, in the countryside or whatever it may be that, that gives you pleasure. Mm. We're kind of already lucky. Yeah, no, I think, um, I think you're right. That's how you get perspective, isn't it? Yeah. Through yeah. doing that. And, but uh, these, you know, these things, these values are always, you know, beneficial. It would, it would just become a compromise where somebody who is an extreme or, or fairly extreme ectomorph, you know, has a dream of becoming Mr. Olympia. That's going to be damaging to that individual ultimately because they are not going to get to that place. With all the exogenous steroids and growth hormone and whatever else the, 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 the Olympia bodybuilders is taking nowadays, that individual still ain't ever going to look like the guys who get on that stage. And that would be unhealthy where you're constantly beating yourself up. So I would say have realistic goals for yourself. You know, if you can, if you can see an individual who you think, yeah, damn, they're not too far away from, from kind of where I am and they got themselves in great shape, you know, that would be a, a more healthy role model if you need to have a role, a role model for that kind of thing or an expectation of what you can achieve. Um, but again, you know, we're all individuals and, and how we look ultimately is going to come down to, to the genetic hand we've been dealt. Definitely. Um, question for you. You know, what I find really interesting is, um, and, you know, Doug, Doug mentions this, is how strong, you know, really lean guys can get. Mm. Um, you know, I, I've noticed that in myself. And I'd be really interested in your yourself and your clients. Yep. Yep. Do you notice that? The, the skinnier guys are actually really strong and if not sometimes stronger than the bolder guys. If that is possible. Mm. Now, uh, one thing I, I sometimes find, and this is kind of true of, of the skinny guys and a lot of women, is that they can per- often, not always, but often those people can perform high intensity exercise better initially. Okay, they, they, Perhaps are more in touch. Their neurological system is is more more capable than than the bigger guys in some cases. And certainly, there can be some skinny people who way outlive somebody who you think they wouldn't be able to outlive. That is that I've seen time and time again. On the other hand, I've also seen really big guys with a really good ability to um, 
get at their nervous system or get their nervous system to get at their muscular system uh, who can just you know they they're not going to be touched by a guy with, with slimmer muscles or skinnier muscles uh, who can just they can they've got the muscle and they can turn it on and, and i think that's the difference is you have some ectomorphs who can turn all of their muscle on and they'll lift you know weight way beyond what you think they'd be able to you've got some far bigger guys who are you know, you'd expect way more of them who are unable to. And they just can't switch all of their muscle on. They, they just don't have the nervous system to do that as well. Um, and then you've got the, the guys who are blessed in that respect, who've got the muscle and can get at that muscle. And boy, when you see somebody like that, um, you go, wow, you know, that's, that's really impressive as to how much that individual can, can shift. You know, it's like, ultimately, you're talking about shifting weight at the end of the day. It's yeah. impressive how much that person can shift um, with good technique. Yeah. Cool. Um, we have a technical question. So one of the things Doug said in one of the podcasts I listened to was, um, this just confused me. So he talked about how, you know, the glycogen storage in the muscle. Yes. yes. For lean guys, um, whilst obviously muscle tissue doesn't appear to be bigger, the glycogen reserves are do increase which obviously has a, a fat loss um, benefit in that um, insulin sensitivity improves, etc. Now, how is that? Do you know what, how that is? How a lean person is able to store more glycogen, yet they they visibly don't appear any bigger? Well, I, 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 uh, the answer to that is... is the, what am I talking about? Technically, um, I'm not sure about that. I'd need to, to, to double check on that, look that up. Uh, yeah. uh, what, what comes immediately to mind is, is um, you're increasing um, the space to some degree for, for a greater uptake of, of glycogen, you know, within the muscle just because you have, you know, uh, more um, of the slow, 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 more, more, say, slow twitch type muscle fiber doesn't mean that there's not things happening within the muscle fibers themselves. Mm. Right. Okay. Because I was wondering whether it was um, I kind of had a a little memory there where it was the because you're increasing your the size of your fast twitch muscle fibers which store the most glycogen. Right. Right. I thought yes, that yes. might be it. I'm probably answering that, my own that question. Would, that would make that sense would as sense well. Of course, you know, you know, you know, you might only have, have uh, proportionally have speaking, a, a relatively uh, small amount of, of, of fast twitch. Uh, muscle fiber but once you get at it you're still um getting it to 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 change although what will happen um is is that the very fast uh, twitch fibers actually start to take on um characteristics of, of the more intermediate type fibers um with proper strength training right okay so what you'll see is um a greater distribution of um, fibers that are behaving like the so-called intermediate type fibers after somebody starts training, um, resistance training. Um, the, the, the individuals with the most um, fast twitch uh, percentage muscle fiber are, are actually people who are paralyzed. Really? Yeah, they have the greatest percentage of fast twitch muscle fiber. How is that? Um, because um, there's this, this withering of away, away from disuse um, of the the um, slow twitch fiber, intermediate twitch fibers, and you'll see it as well. The other the other guys who who tend to have um, the most fast twitch would be sprinters. You know, those those who can perform really well for about ten second period. But uh, when people are a training um, for hypertrophy, you're actually shifting things towards the intermediate um, uh, end of the scale and, and creating fibers that behave more with those characteristics. Okay, cool. Right, so I've got a couple of random questions for you at the end here. Um, first one is, what is the biggest mistake you see people doing um, when they're doing high intensity training? Okay, with, with, without a doubt, it's the technique. Okay, yeah, I, ju I just don't think that people, um, typically speaking, um, 
get the importance of correct technique. They may give it lip service, but when they're under that load, things start to come apart. And I'm not talking terrible. And in comparison to most people at the gym, they're doing way better in terms of technique. But I think people are still, many people are still aware. This is, this is something that happens typically for me. Is I'll have somebody who's um, read about high intensity training and applied it for, let's say, six, 12 months. And then they call me up and say, oh, could I have a one off with you? Um, I just want to check that I'm doing it right. And then they'll come in and they'll have that experience with me. And without fail, they'll say, ah, OK, I have experienced something completely different today. Um, <laughs> now I get what this intensity thing is. I thought I was training intensely before. And really what that is, is I'm just, now then there will be an element that we spoke about earlier about when you're being observed and when you have a professional guiding you through, you're going to perform better. But of course there'll be an element of that. But the other thing is, I have, prior to getting them on the equipment, really emphasize the technique and I've really dug down into what I consider to be important about technique and, and speed of movement and control. And then I pick them up on that during the exercise and will not let them get away with repetitions, which are what I would consider to be substandard. And that's why they have this dramatic experience. We all get caught up if we're not careful. And, and I think there isn't anybody of us, even involved in the high intensity training world, who can't think at some point their psychology ran away with them saying, I must lift more weight. I want to chase the time increase or chase the load increase. Um, you know, that that's something that proves I'm succeeding and getting stronger. And therefore, I will do whatever it takes, even or at least at a subconscious level, I'll do whatever it takes to make sure that happens. And I think you've always got to wind it back in and go, what were the quality of the reps? Otherwise, you're comparing apples with oranges anyway. OK, because if, if, you know, if one time you lifted, uh, you know, 100, uh, 100 kilograms um, with superb technique and the next time you lifted 110 for the same time under load with technique that was 10 percent off compared to the previous time, you're not comparing apples with apples. Uh, and people mislead themselves with that and mislead themselves into believing that they're making progress. And the further you, the more you allow that to happen, like, you know, the first time you do that from one session to the next, it might be a very small thing. But then you'll put an exponential amount of pressure on yourself again the session after that to adhere to that time under load or, or weight increase that you want. And then so exponentially you're your form over time, it might not be even noticeable to start off with, starts just getting slightly, slightly worse the whole time. And I do think it makes a huge difference to the experience of high intensity training. It almost sounds like you'd almost think that would be the boring bit, getting the technique right. But actually, I really believe that getting the technique right is what leads to intensity. That's what, what drives the intensity, is the technique. Um, yes, you could put a really ridiculously heavy load for yourself and it would feel intense or you could really focus on on your control of a given load and, and your control through every centimeter of every repetition and how many of us can say we do that every session and and sometimes we need to bring it back in um and 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 that's what would that's where i see the biggest mistake is people start to um separate away um, from good technique. They might think they've got it or they might give it lip service, but actually you need to rein it back in and see, well, how good of a quality are these repetitions um, that I'm performing? Cool. That's a good answer. Um, what's your view on supplements and what do you take and why? Oh, goodness. Um, yeah. Uh, Supplement-wise... Um, I go through phases of, of, of taking um, supplements. Um, I, in terms of sort of the ones that are traditionally the other like muscle building ones, I've tried creatine, um, and and from way back, from way back, back in you know late nineties and. and occasionally since then, um, doesn't make a massive difference for me. Um, in terms of performance or in terms of uh, muscular size. 
um, but it does for some people. So I think that can be valuable, uh, particularly if you want to see an increase in muscular volume uh, for some people. Um, one which I picked up from Doug was uh, glutamine post-workout to, to blunt um, the drop in immunity that happens immediately after a high-intensity workout. Interesting. Uh, you know that? that that one I think is is useful because I work for days that I'm training people with a lot of people, you know, coming and going, you know, it could be bugs people are bringing in and so on okay. and so forth. And if I happen to have my workout scheduled for one of those days, um, I will take that immediately post-workout um, because um, there is this sort of two or three hour window where your immunity is slightly depressed post the workout. And that can help bring it back up um, more quickly um, so that your, your immune system isn't going to be compromised during that time. Now, uh, the, the plus side, by the way, to that immune that slight immune dip is you get a, 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 a greater overcompensation uh, that occurs once you get past that three, four hour stage and, and there's this big bounce back in the immune system and actually goes sort of beyond where it was prior to the workout. So it's sort of one of those positive effects of the workout. Uh, but, but yeah, so, so glutamine under those circumstances. Um, vitamin D I take in, in our British winters. Uh, yeah, I'm taking it at the moment. <laughs> um, I do do uh, have quite a few more things that I that I take. Um, but I again I go through waves of taking them and not. So I might take some of the B vitamins. Um, I like to balance zinc and iron. So if it's not balanced in my diet, I'll, I'll take uh, supplementation of those. Do you do um? Do you get your biomarkers checked regularly? Um, I, I I do not. I I'm not a massive fan of doing that. I okay. I had to have some uh, uh, blood tests done um, not too long ago, um, and they all came back. You know, as the doctor said, perfect. <laughs> Um, and, and I, you know, I make a, I actually, you know, this is not something that I would give away as advice. This is just something I do as a personal thing here. Is uh, typically do not tell um, medical health professionals about the way I eat, um, or, or for that matter, exercise, because I don't want them typically to make a, a pre-appraisal of. of um, and, and as I say, I just need to make this really, really clear. I don't advise this, by the way. I, 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 the reason I do this is... Are you saying you lie to them? Uh, 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 no. no. <laughs> I just stick clear of those topics. Right. Because <laughs> I don't want a bias prior to any kind of result. So, you know, if you say, you know, fat makes up 60% of my diet um, on many days of the week, um, most of the, the NHS doctors in the UK here are going to start to go crazy and start thinking statins and, you know, stuff like that. I would rather not get onto the topic of diet, get my blood results back from them, and then then I might open up and say, well, actually, by the way, you know, for the last six years, most of my diet consists of, in terms of a calorific value, of fat. Beautiful. Well, how do they respond to that? Um, that kind of, flight, you know, sort of get a, a double take is typically the reaction. No, that's yeah. not to say there aren't some doctors over here who, who you know, um, uh, who who are now, you know, uh, embracing this type of uh, uh, approach to nutrition, and, and you know, it's certainly becoming more accepted, and uh, and it will continue to be so. Uh, but I, yeah, absolutely, me me too. But I think at the moment, um, the likelihood is you're probably going to meet one of the other types. Of, of, yeah. I mean, it's like Doug said, uh, I can't remember if he said this to me or something else I, I listened to, but he said in America, they, he uses the hose analogy. Like you go to medical school and they shove a hose in your mouth and you just absorb all the information, but you don't really analyze it critically. Or, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, that, and I'm not, you know, I'm, no, I'm, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a medical profession, a professional even. I don't know if, the, the, if that kind of treatment is the same here but it certainly seems like it is that there's so much information to absorb that you just accept it versus actually thinking about it more and if it makes sense and how recent are those studies are they peer-reviewed you know are they double blind whatever you know are they accurate studies that are 
that are I, underpinning I, 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 this exactly, stuff. Yeah. yeah, Lawrence, exactly. I think what you, you're talking about there is a person's going to need to develop a passion for that particular topic with it. If they're a GP and they, you know, they, they're the first port of call of, you know, a million and one conditions and even people who don't have conditions that are, you know, paranoid about their health or whatever. And, and right. that's the first port of call. You know, I think for a doctor, a, a, a GP would have to be, have a, develop a personal passion about nutrition specifically. Mm. To, to 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 as you all of those things you've just said to look into all of those things that you you've just mentioned, um, to to begin to have sort of perhaps a more up to date um, understanding of nutrition. Mm. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Actually, that's a good point. That um, because these subjects are so vast, and that's one thing I realised. I was having lunch with someone the other day, and he asked me advice for stretching. And I started saying, you know, I, I like the Doug Richards YouTube video about stretching, which is that stretching is really not that useful at all. In fact, it's counterproductive prior to training and that you're weakening the muscle. Yeah. Um, and that if you should stretch, it should be either after training or as a siloed activity. Yeah. Yep. Um, that's kind of my stance. But that being said, that I'm scratching the surface. Stretching in itself is such a vast topic. Yeah. Um, and it's so hard to be a specialist in everything. You know, I, I do consider myself kind of a generalist on this stuff. Um, and I think you're like, you're absolutely right. It, it's, it, it would take so much passion and intrigue on a doctor's part to have the understanding of some of these topics in the depth that we're, that we kind of expect that me and you would like. Yeah. I suppose. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And yeah. they, we, you know, I think, I think they, 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 they guys perform a great, great service, service much of the time, time. Um, um, as GPs and helping a lot of people. Lot of people. Um, um, you know, you know but, but, but sometimes I would be, be from, this is again, this is for me personally, I, I'm just a, a, aware of... It's a touchy believe, subject. That <laughs> yeah, and I believe my health is my responsibility, primarily. And I will, I'm passionate enough. Uh, about, about my body, my, body, my nutrition, my exercise, my exercise, to do what, what I consider to be the most sensible things, things for my body based, based on the information I've accrued and, and, and studied, studied and looked and through and, and researched, researched and so on. And, and, and I consider that my responsibility. responsibility. And, 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 you, you know, having done that, done to turn that, up to a doc, doc a, a, general a general practitioner, practitioner and, and, and say, you know, what all you're telling me my cholesterol is high, what do you suggest I do? Um, would that person, for me, be the best person to give that advice? Um, not necessarily. Um, and, you know, I think I, I'm not a huge expert in the area of, of prescribing medicine, but, um, you know, I, I, it wouldn't surprise me if there are, um, you know, uh, there are incentive to, incentives to prescribe certain drugs because the NHS has, has decided this is going to be policy for this condition. And then you've got to decide as an individual, well, you know, you know, who, who do I rely on in this circumstance? And I, from, again, purely for myself, I would just need to, to, to be um, – Anything I do to do with my health, I, I want to know. I, I want to have as great an understanding so I, I can make as clear a decision based on all of the information that I have as to whether this, this particular thing, whatever it may be, is an, is an advisable course of action for me. But, of course, not everybody's going to have that degree of interest um, in exercise or nutrition. But that's why I think we need reliable heuristics, you know, sources of information that are efficient and that don't require you to delve so deep into these subjects and we lack reliable heuristics. Do, yeah, I do, think one of the great that? things that the internet has done is it's is it, is allowed so much um, transference of information and so much freedom of information and I would hate for anything to stop that or get in the way of that because I think it's been one of the, well, it's been the most amazing thing um, to happen over the last 20 years. And I count myself lucky to be living in an era where we have this. And, and so far we've had it pretty much um, unfettered and free and, uh, in terms of what information we can access. And, and I hope nothing gets in the way of that in the future. 
Um, but uh, yeah, I think you're absolutely right that you, you know it's not often simple to say. Let's say I, let's say um, I know nothing about. Um, uh, let's say I know nothing about exercise. I, 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 I'm just just looking to get into it, and I go onto my computer. Where in the heck am I going to start? Yeah. You know, how much information am I going to have to go through to get to a place where I where I've got a decent understanding? Yeah. Do you know, I'm a, I'm in the process at the moment of researching a second uh, ebook that I'm putting together um, on fat loss. Um, yeah. And <laughs> I I I. I I'm doing I'm in the in the process of doing a bit of more research for it. And I just had a look at what are the top five blogs if you put in how to lose the last five or ten pounds on Google. Interesting. And because and and, that's going to be kind of the premise of the book is like how to lose that last bit, you know. Awesome. Um, and I just was absolutely I mean, I, I was not shocked because I knew there'd be a lot of crap. But the first five blogs just unbelievably bad. Like the the the, the information is so poor. Um, yeah, these are the most popular five. five. Exactly, yeah, top five, you know, on Google. Yeah. Um, the information is is counterproductive, and it's sad because it's kind of what motivated me. So I've, I've got one book, which uh, ebook, which I've put together um, already on Amazon, and one of the motivations to do that, as well as obviously making a bit of money, um, was to provide something that would bring together a lot of these really effective concepts. Um, from Doug and guys like Tim Ferriss um, into one place and then distilling them down to their simple sort of guidelines. Yeah, yeah. And then helping people, you know, with real research-based stuff that actually works. And, you know, the combination of high-intensity training and a, and a low-carb, high, high-fat, moderate-protein diet is just nothing at the moment that even touches that, that, those two protocols. Um, and, and, yeah, and if, you, if you go on Amazon right now and you, you look at like the top, the top ebooks on fat loss, you know, I've, I've obviously through my creation of, of my, my books, I've, and I'm sure you put perhaps on the same, is I've, I've looked through some of these books to see what information I can learn. And it's often just a load of crap. Um, yeah. I'm really slinging mud here, but I, I just, you know. I've looked, looked at, a, you know, a handful of those. I think those types of books that you're 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 talking about, and yeah, um, I, I think you know, uh, in in this in in the world of nutrition, um, you know, slick marketing and advertising go, obviously goes a long way. But, um, um, people are often looking for the next thing you know the next the next thing and let me jump jump to this diet because um either it's trendy right now or or there's an, an amazing before and after shot of somebody or or some or something you know and, you know it's natural we we as human beings we would you know you see uh, you see somebody really overweight you know suddenly looking really skinny and, and that's used as a marketing promo material um that, that's kind of that's very very attractive and the, the the thing that typically happens with with um this poor let's say poor quality nutritional advice put into uh, books or ebooks and, and and then sold is that people tend not to blame themselves. Sorry, people tend not to blame the book or the information. They blame themselves. So, but let, let's say you buy this book on um, weight loss, and it makes some really bold, pretty amazing claims. But there's some great before and after shots there, and it, it's sold in a really cool, flashy way. Get into the information and, and start reading about it. And this information is really, really bloody complex. Uh, you're going to struggle to adhere to this thing. You're really, in fact, forget having a job. Your job now is going to have to be preparing and eating food in the manner that this, this particular book might be advising you to. Um, and people sort of give it a bit of a go and then cannot sustain that. And then they don't blame the book, they blame themselves. Oh, well, no, the information in the book was probably right. It was just that I couldn't do all of that stuff. Yeah, that's true. Well, if it's not practical information, it is not useful information. And but unfortunately, you know, it's easy. It's relatively easy to hit people's hotspots when it comes to such a sensitive topic as weight loss and nutrition. 
Yeah, sure. And how are you doing for time, by the way? Because I'm just um, aware that we've been speaking for a long time. I am good for another. Where are we? Good for another fifteen minutes. I'm, I'm going to need to I need to go out then, but I'm good for no a few more minutes. If there's anything more you would like to cover. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, okay, so peanut butter, yep. good or bad? Um, okay, uh, peanuts are legumes and can cause them. They do have some anti nutrients in. Um, so uh, I wouldn't make it a staple of my diet, my nutrition. Um, you know, people people get around that by you know having um, almond butter instead, um, which potentially can be a, a more um, healthy source. Uh, for, for for people who are set, particularly sensitive, let's say, um, but I I still I wouldn't be making personally I wouldn't be making a nut butter like a a big staple of my diet anyway. Right. Okay. Just ask you that because um, me and my uh, my partner we eat a lot. I say a lot. We probably have, you know, it's kind of like a snack in between meals. Sure. Um, and I I just I I heard that they have aflatoxin. I think. Is the right uh, yeah. property, and that's not good. Um, it's so like peanuts, right? right? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be eating peanut butter. I'd switch over to almond. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. I, I'll look into that. Um, are you, are you familiar with Dave Asprey and the bulletproof diet? Uh, 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 yes, I am familiar with Dave Asprey, and yeah. uh, pretty much, I think I've got the concept of his diet. I think it's, it, it's a uh, good approach to nutrition. Uh, yeah really in line with my thoughts on, on nutrition and uh, I got to thank the guy for introducing me to uh, Bulletproof Coffee. Uh, oh, do you drink that, do you? I, I make a version of my interpretation of, of, of what that is, which is um, a little bit of um, Dave's advice, a little bit of Drew's advice and a little bit of my own advice. So what I'll what I do is it's, you know, freshly ground coffee that I, I make sure that I source stuff that I consider to be good. Um, and then I will blend in um, three tablespoons of coconut oil, one egg yolk. And I also put in um, like a, a slice of butter as well. So that's my interpretation of a, of a bulletproof coffee. Nice. I'm really jealous because I don't like coffee. I hate it. Ah. Um, and I really yeah. want to try the bulletproof coffee. Does it taste just like coffee, or does it taste different? Oh no, it's, it's, it's sure it's got the coffee taste. <laughs> it, 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 you know, the first time I did it, um, and before I'd adapted the recipe to exactly what I enjoyed, um, it, it was kind of a little bit. Um, Oh goodness, what is this? This sounds crazy. And I, I think my girlfriend thought I was mad. And, you know, any family members I mentioned it to thought I was mad. But it, actually, it's a really delicious drink. And I know some people try it with tea or a, a form of tea. I haven't looked into that, but maybe, maybe, are you okay with tea? Yeah, I love tea. I love tea. Yeah, maybe you could find a way of doing it with that if you felt the need to. I mean, why, why it works for me is I do enjoy, um, remaining in a fasted state through the morning. And yet, and yet having, having quite a lot of fat calories, fat calories to give me energy. That's really interesting. Okay, so that's not going to take me out of autophagy um, from the night before by just having pure fat calories with the coffee. So I'm still going to accrue the benefits of fasting whilst taking in a relatively large amount of calories and giving me the energy to get through my morning. So oftentimes I'm not going to have my first solid food of the day till like two in the afternoon, something like that. And that's because you're... I guess you're so you're you're running on ketones through the morning, right? Yes. yes. So you don't you're able to utilize body fat for fuel and ketones, and so you won't actually have to, you have probably what two solid meals a day? Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Big because that's big ones. But uh, sorry. Big yeah. So big meals, two big meals. It'll be like two in the afternoon, and then you know somewhere sometime around eight at night. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. So my, my eating window is sort of about that eight hour window as well. Um, so you can say I'm in, in, in a fast for around about 16 hours. Yeah. But with, with, a, with quite considerable fat intake in the morning. Yeah, it makes sense. And that works for me again. If somebody is an ectomorph and, and they want to look to do, um, uh, some, some, um, fasting, short, short, you know, 16 hour um, type fasting. 
then I think one of certainly for me and, and the, the rate at which I burn off energy, I would would not be able to do it, or it would be unlikely it would be comfortable for me to do without taking in a fat source. And so that can make that type of fasting, which has many health benefits, um, uh, suitable. Uh, uh, for some people, for for, for examples who who might otherwise struggle to to gain the benefits of that. Okay, cool. So, if you could only give free tips to someone who wants to improve their health, what would your top free tips be? Okay. Wow. Okay. My top three tips. Number one would be modulate your stress. Okay, so do you think that's a big one? I think I that's think possibly, possibly the most, most critical. critical. It's there with there nutrition. With nutrition. Um, um, the, that that's, that's such, such a biggie. A biggie. Uh, yeah. I think, I think it, it really depends, you know, how much you're enjoying your life and what you do in your life and the people around you and um, the activities you engage in and how hard you have to work and. You know, you know, some of these some things of these are going to come out of sync if you have a particular value that you're pursuing for a period of time, like uh, starting a business or whatever it may be. You 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 will need to make uh, some choices, which mean it's not possible to to remain, you know, kind of blissed out the whole time. And in fact, that's not a great place to be either. Um, you know, we need some positive stresses which challenge us, but we also need the downtime. And it, it's all about creating a balance. And I, I I'm a big um, believer in, in the importance of that and the importance of that for, for our physiological health, our psychological health and um, our also our ability to, to gain benefit from high intensity uh, exercise. Uh, I think you've, you've got to have that stuff in place. Um, and, and let me throw sleep in with that. So all of that's together. Uh, that would be number one. Number two. That's uh, cheating. <laughs> number two is bending. Um, the nutrition side of things, you know, if, if somebody's eating uh, just horrible food, just just fast food crap the whole time and then throwing and living a high stress lifestyle and then throwing in exercise, high intensity exercise on that, hoping it's going to do something for them. Yeah, the exercise is going to have some benefit possibly, but I really think the very least as well as you need to be honed in on that nutrition to a degree. And we started off this whole conversation by saying, you know, 80, 90 percent of the time is fine. You know, get it right. 80 to 90 percent of the time for most people. And you're, you're golden. You're in a good place. Um, so, yeah, certainly the next step would be nutrition. And then that third, that third um, part of the pyramid of the triangle would, would be the high intensity exercise. So if you have your stress under control you have some ways of dealing with stress you have some ways of um, being aware of when you need to step back um, if you need to meditate do tai chi do something really relaxing for you whatever it is great awesome you're in a good place then psychologically to um, engage in the physical stuff and the physical stuff would include the nutrition which is going to give you the energy um, that you need. It's going to enable you to get to a place where um, you're going to find an ideal-ish weight for you, uh, again, based on your genetics um, to a large degree. Uh, it's going to provide you with the energy to get through your day, to be focused, to work, etc. Um, and, and then the high-intensity exercise. And, and have fun doing it, you know, enjoy the process. All of this has got to be done with uh, um, in, you're enjoying your journey through life and, and you're enjoying this whole process um, because, you know, once it's gone, it's gone. So. Absolutely. Uh, that's, great, that's great advice. Great advice for listeners. Um, OK, so how do how do people contact you, son? What how do tell 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 the, the listeners what? How do people get access to your services? Obviously, I'll have some of this in the show notes as well. Yeah. But yeah. How, how do people um, how do people get into that? Sure. So um, uh, the, the best place to go if you if you're interested in high intensity training, high intensity exercise is hituni.com. H i t u n i dot com. Um, that um, is where I'm doing our 
currently all of my blogging, so all of my writing about uh, exercise and when I get around to it, nutrition as well, is, is, is going up there. Um, and if you're interested in exercise, that's the place to go. If you're interested in high intensity training and exercise. And then if you're developing an interest in becoming a trainer, that is obviously where we uh, have our online platform um, for our courses. Um, and we, we have three courses for personal trainers. So we have um, the high intensity uh, personal trainer course, um, which is for somebody who's n not a personal trainer yet. Um, and uh, hasn't taken a course before and wants to just jump straight on in. That covers everything. Then we have the CPD course. And what that is, that's for somebody who's already a personal trainer and doesn't need to go over all the anatomy and physio physiology stuff again. They've got a fairly sound grasp of that, but just wants the high intensity training information. Um, that's a, a slightly condensed course just focused on, on purely on, on the uh, exercise front. So if you're already qualified, you can take that. And then there's the, uh, the Masters, which is going to be coming out next year, which will have a, uh, a little bit more to it. And, and obviously trainers can up to upgrade to that in time. So hit uni.com for that stuff. If somebody's just interested in, in um, uh, refining their high intensity training technique, um, and if we can get our diaries to, to, to match up, then go to simonshawcross.com. Um, there's the contact details there for um, uh, getting in touch with me regarding it, sort of in-person training or telephonically or via the Internet. Um, so those, those are the places where you can find out that information. Cool. I might take you off on that myself, actually. Uh, it would be an absolute pleasure. I, I really enjoy talking with you, Lawrence. You sound like a lovely guy, and I, 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 thanks, It'd be great to meet in person and, and, and go for a workout and, and spend a bit more time talking as well. Cool. No, likewise. It's uh, it's been awesome um, just hearing your your opinion on a lot of these things, um, and I yeah, I'm definitely going to do your personal training course actually because I think actually one quick question I had about that is. How do you, I'm sure it is a fantastic course and, um, and you've thought a lot about it and made sure that you're teaching people the right things, but how do you make sure it's credible? I think it, it, it is credible um, on its um, information, on what it imparts. Um, it's been checked through. It is the latest most up-to-date up interpretation of high-intensity training based on all the experiences you know we've accumulated from the 70s up to today uh, and including um, takes on the latest research that has been been done in the last few years as well um, in terms of then credibility as us as a business I think that grows with people doing the courses um, it grows with the quality of free information we put out there via the blog as well um, and that is where I want us to make a change in the marketplace um, I'm looking at uh, whether we go down uh, down the approach of, of in the UK, there's, there's there's a governmental agency that kind of um, overlooks the sort of more traditional personal training um, fitness type courses as to, as to whether we want to uh, to to be associated with that and to to um, very cool get 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 ticked off with that. Um, and I and I think we possibly like to pursue that for the CPD side of things um, because that would that would be valuable to people who are who are perhaps in the UK already personal trainers. Um, but I, more than that, what's more important than that to me is that, um, it is perceived as high quality, um, high intensity training exercise information that will, will enable, um, somebody new to this or somebody experienced to become an excellent high intensity trainer, um, amongst, um, my peers and the peers out there and people who take the course. Um, that's, our first and foremost uh, sort of resonator of, of, of respect and respectability, as it were. Um, that's what's important to me is, is people who are uh, in the high intensity training world and, and, and the feedback that I get from from those people and from the people who take our course. Um, you know, we're very hands on with, with 
with the people who take the course it's not just sort of like this online internet thing and, and you know you never get in touch I ensure that there are Skype conversations with everybody who takes the course and you know it's essential for us but, but not only do we have the online exams um, and essay questions but we also have a, a video component um, to the examination so that I get to see that person in the real world performing um, via via video uh, and then we can break that down as we talk through so there's a lot of interaction um, with people who, who take that to ensure that the quality of it you know I can we can control the quality of the information we put out through the site we kind of need to see that back on the other end too so we need to see the videos as well as the exams uh, of the people who are qualifying to ensure for the end user uh, of hit uni qualified trainers that there is that quality there and um, I, I'm certainly enjoying that process of getting to interact with, with, with the people who are taking the course currently. Good stuff. Well, you heard it here first. Get yourself to hit uni. If you're a personal trainer, get yourself to hituni.com and get yourself that personal training qualification. Or if you are just really in high intensity training, want to improve your form and your performance, um, get onto your blog and other resources as well that you've, uh, that you've mentioned. Um, Cool. Well, look, I will let you go now, Simon, um, and and do what you need to do. <laughs> but um, thanks very much for your time tonight. I really, really appreciate it. It's been awesome. Lawrence, it was a real pleasure. Enjoyed it very much. I'll be in touch, yeah? Love. All the best. Okay, bye for now. Bye. Cheers. Bye.